you can be forgiven by the merit, by the good works, but you are still responsible for your sins. And therefore, you cannot go, even if you are a forgiven sinner, to heaven. Because you're responsible for your sins. So where do you go? Go to purgatory. And what do you do in purgatory? You suffer. You pay the consequence for your sin. Let me make another comparison. My wife and I have an argument. And she's definitely wrong. <laughs> and uh, how would this feel? I go to her and I say to her, or she comes to me and she says, I'm sorry. I was wrong in what I did. Sounds terrible. Let's turn it around. It's more logical. I mean, and I go to her and I say to her, I'm sorry for what I did. Will you forgive me? And she says, yes. And we hug and we make up. And I turn around and the next thing, I get this flower pot smashed over my head. And I turn around and I say, what was that for? And she says, I forgave you, but you still had consequences to bear. So I decided to smash this flower vase over your head. Do you get my drift? It's the same thing. You have been forgiven by the merit of Jesus Christ. You have been forgiven, but you must still pay the consequences of your sin. So, not only did Jesus not die for you, he never took the consequences of your sin upon himself in Catholicism. That's why you go to purgatory. Now, the only one who can hand out grace, which is forgiveness, is the church. The church can hand out grace. So the Pope has the power to release you from purgatory. Now in Martin Luther's day, they sold the indulgences. And Martin Luther was upset about that because they were getting money for this gift that the Pope can hand out. And the Pope has just declared, again, a whole year of indulgences where he will forgive you if you do certain things. That is not Christianity. It denies Jesus Christ at every single level. It denies him in his humanity. It denies him on the cross. It denies him in the atonement. It denies him in grace. Because he doesn't even hand out the grace. It is the Pope that hands out the grace. And he'll do it nine out of ten times by the so-called merit of the saints. So now my question is, how does one then continue with the system? If this is the case, and then the one who has promulgated the case, made the case, declares himself infallible cannot make a mistake when it comes to doctrinal issues, when he speaks ex cathedra. Who is then the author of truth? Is it God or is it the Pope? It is the Pope. Now my next question is, can any Protestant who knows the doctrine of salvation accept the leadership and headship of the Pope in terms even of Christianity. Yes or no? No. It's impossible. This is Antichrist. This is not coming down in the flesh. This is a denial of the whole plan of salvation. If we want to be thorough, then we have to explain that justice and mercy were satisfied at the cross. Justice and mercy kissed each other at the cross. And all the arguments of the devil fell flat. 
That you cannot be just and merciful at the same time because the two exclude each other. So they fall flat at the cross. So when I look at the cross, I look at a God, my God, who took the consequences of my sin upon himself. And then he died not only for me, but as me. That's incredible. And then he asks me, do you accept this free gift? I lay down my life. I take it up again. He's God. If he's not God, he can't do this. And I'm willing to give it to you. But there's a little consequence or there's a little decision you must make. You must be willing to die to sin in Christ and be resurrected in him to obedience. And that's where most evangelicals fall flat because they get rid of the commandments of God. But if you get rid of the commandments of God, then the whole plan of salvation makes no sense. Because why would you pay the consequence if you can get rid of the cause? Right? Okay, so that's the difference and we need to understand it. So Catholicism is not Christianity. It's an invented system with invented rules based on salvation by works. Malta, ahead. We're going to crash into Malta. Now, we started when? At seven. How long does this go? <laughs> we have to work our way through in this camp meeting right up until the present time to see where we are in this conflict. And we have to get rid of all these other concepts of what's happening in the world because the real war is not fought out there on a battlefield. The real war is taking place in the minds of people. And we have a message to bear to every nation, tribe, and people. So we have a universal message. So we want all denominations and all religions to come and listen to this. That's what we want. All right, what happens when Malta is ahead? This is the main church of the Jesuits. And outside you have two statues, one over there and one over there, with a male figure crushing a woman to smithereens. Now the one is Ignatius Loyola and the other one is Francis Xavier, two founding fathers of the Jesuits. Peter Faber, I don't know, they should make another one at the back somewhere. So here they are crushing the life out of Protestantism. If you go into these churches, they had statues there with the wording. They were clearly marked, this is so-and-so crushing Martin Luther. Getting rid of them. If you go inside, here you have Mary crushing, interestingly enough, Martin Luther and Johann Hus, Banishing them from heaven. And there's an angel tearing up their writings. Can you see that? And this was clearly marked before Vatican II. And since then, they've removed the captions, but they haven't removed the statues. Because the aim is still exactly the same. The Jesuit order exists solely to the destruction of Protestantism. And if Protestantism capitulates, which it has and will do, and we will see exactly how, by their own documents, and when, we'll see that too. Well, there we are, the only ones left that will have to bear this wrath. Here is the same statue that we find on uh, that main church in Quebec, right here, just above your border. So this is the aim of the Jesuit order, the destruction of Protestantism. And this is what is so foul. 
because it is done clandestinely under a cloak of Christianity, substituting salvation by Christ through social order, a new social order. The Gnostic Society Library. The Hermetic tradition represents a non-Christian lineage of Hellenistic Gnosticism. The tradition and its writings date to at least the first century before Common Era, and the texts we possess were all written prior to the second century. The surviving writings of the tradition, knows, uh, known as the Hermetic body of writings, were lost to the Latin world, but then they were rediscovered. Now, who gathered all the Gnostic writings again? The man responsible was Cosimo de Medici. Now, Medici lived 1389 to 1464, and during this period, when they were discussing the split of Roman Catholicism into the Orthodox and the other, and tried to reconcile these issues, uh, Cosimo de Medici worked together with the Turkish rulers to gather the ancient Gnostic writings from the Greek world. And this became a very, very prominent family. Kings, queens, and popes come from his lineage. So the Medici family, very important. Cosimo also organized the methodical search for ancient manuscripts, both within Christendom and even with Sultan Mehmed's permission in the East. The manuscripts picked up by his agents form the core of the incomparable library that is rather unjustly called Laurentium, Laurentiana, after his grandson. He opened it to the public and employed copyists in order to disseminate scholarly editions. Did it go off? I'm out. So either this thing or me or I ran out of batteries. All right, I just want to give you a little basis here. In short, he was well prepared for the singular opportunity that came his way in 1439 when he went to the Council of Florence, and there he gathered all of these works. If you look it up on any encyclopedia, even Wikipedia, it tells you about the House of Medici, it was a political dynasty, it was a banking dynasty, it was a royal house, uh, had a Medici bank. The popes that came from the Medici family were Pope Leo X. That's the Pope of the Reformation. Pope Clement and Pope Pius. And uh, two regent queens, Catherine de Medici, uh, Dukes of Florence. So very, very prominent people. Where do you think that library ended up? In the Vatican, of course. The medic tradition represents non-Christian lineage of Hellenistic Gnosticism. The central text of the tradition is the Corpus Hermeticum. And these writings are the occult answer to Christianity. They are the counter which was to destroy the mindset of Christianity. Particularly, of course, Protestantism. And the man who became the harborers of the Medici learning and the one who was instructed to spread this teaching throughout the world was none other than Ignatius Loyola. And so they started the Jesuit schools. Another Medici, Leo's first cousin, Giulio Medici, took the papal name of Clement II Leo X's corruptions had ignited Luther. Clement's shrewdness determined how the church would deal with the proliferation of Bibles. Clement was personally advised by Machiavelli, inventor of modern political science, and Cardinal Wolseley of England, and he opined that both printing and Protestantism could be turned to Rome's advantage by employing movable type to produce literature that would confuse, diminish, and ultimately 
marginalize the Bible. And to put what they called learning against learning. So two systems of scholarly endeavor came into the world. So against Bible learning, they put Gnostic learning. And the Jesuits started all the schools, the great schools of Europe. And Martin Luther, seeing that learning against learning was the future of Christianity now, voiced an appeal to the ruling classes in which he wrote, Though our children live in the midst of a Christian world, they faint and perish in misery because they lack the gospel in which we should be training and exercising them all the time. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Schools will become wide open gates of hell if they do not diligently engrave the Holy Scripture on young hearts. Every institution where men are not increasingly occupied with the Word of God must become corrupt. That's Martin Luther. So the Jesuits, after the Council of Trent, became the schoolmasters of Europe, where they put this Gnostic learning against Bible learning. And so you have all these plays, which are really Gnostic plays. So Shakespeare probably never wrote most of his himself. And uh, where you have Hamlet making uh, great assumptions about the state of death and everything that it entails and how sweet it is and all these issues surrounding it. If we read... In Signs of the Times, another good Protestant writer says, Infidelity is increasing in our land. Our youth are sent to college and are brought into association with those who hold skeptical views. For even well-educated young men now boast of their unbelief in the word of God. Who is chargeable for the state of affairs? Is it not chargeable to the sacred test for belittling the claims of the law of God? And... So she comes and she says exactly the same thing Martin Luther said. And today, the media is filling the minds of human beings on this planet with a gospel of humanity that is soul-destroying to the Bible. If morality and religion are to live in a school, it must through, be through a knowledge of God's word. Some may argue that if religious teaching is made the prominent in our schools will become unpopular. That those who are not of our faith will not patronize the college. Very well then, let them go to other colleges where they will find a system of education that suits their taste. Our school was established not merely to teach the sciences, but for the purpose of giving instruction to the great principles of God's word. This is the education so much needed in the present time. We wouldn't be in the state we are in if we didn't accept learning against learning. Now, how did this come about? And how did the Jesuits brilliantly put this into action? I think we should make this part of the next one. Because we're going to go all the way through to where we are today. And we will see that the real enemy is sitting here in front of me. And we are about to strike Malta. And if we are not learned and understanding, then we will go along with the flow or we will be swept away by the flow. The war is coming, not just from without, but from within as well. And may God give us the grace and the strength to stand up against these issues now, how did Rome manage to hide itself? How did it manage to surface out of the mortal wound and everybody is wandering after the beast? This is fascinating. And there's nobody in the world that preaches it anymore because the Martin Luthers are dead. And the writer of the Spirit of Prophecies are, is dead. So who is going to be the one who's going to inform the world? If it's not us, it's going to be nobody. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, as we investigate how all these issues that are before us came into being, we need to be wise. We need to be students. We need to understand the issues so that when it comes to a choice, we will know what we are deciding for. Not two parties that are so similar that nobody can see the difference, but two parties that are so different that it is a flaming torch on a hill compared to utter darkness. Help us to know where the hill is so that we may flee to the shadow of your wing. In Jesus' name, amen. The nine situations, I'm not going to read them all, I'm just going to highlight these few. It is the business of a general to be quiet and thus ensure secrecy. He must be able to mystify his officers and men by false reports and appearances and thus keep them in total ignorance. In other words, does a Jesuit foot soldier necessarily understand the whole plot? No. In fact, he's fed misinformation in order that he does not understand the whole plot. But whatever order he gives, when the drum beats once, he does what? He turns to the right. And sharply. And he might not understand the picture, but this is it. He's going to do it. When fire breaks out in an inside of an enemy's camp, respond at once with an attack from outside. So if you see there's a fire burning and they're in trouble, that's when you hit them the hardest. And then he talks about spies. When these five kinds of spies, he says you need five kinds of spies. You need local spies, inward spies, converted spies, doomed spies, and surviving spies. This is incredible. So, these five spies you need. None can discover the secret if you have these five spies in a system. This is called divine manipulation of the threads. Constantly this general is bringing God into the picture and this God that he is quoting is a very deceptive God. Would you agree? So it cannot be the God of the Bible, right? And then he says, let's have a look at local spies, means employing the services of inhabitants of a district. So there will be spies. If there are any spies here this evening, good evening. <laughs> then having inward spies is making use of officials of the enemy. Having converted spies, getting hold of the enemy's spies and using them for your own purposes. Doomed spies. Doing certain things openly for purposes of deception. And allowing our spies to know of them and report them to the enemy. That's mean. So you'd say to some of your people, I want you to do this. The drum beats, boom, you're going to do it. But it's a deception. And it's something that will rile the country where you are doing this. Make them angry. Then you use your other agent to go to the ruler and say, I know who did it. It was them. Then it's your own people. And then they will be arrested and possibly executed. They're doomed spies. They're going to die. But they're your own people. You're going to kill them. What does that achieve for the general? that the ruler now has absolute trust in the spy that told him. And therefore you have an inside angle that you never had before. So sometimes it appears as if the Jesuits are in two camps <coughs> opposing each other and fighting each other. And one of them may be a doomed spy and the other one might be a spy that tells the generals about him. Okay. And then you need surviving spies. Finally, are those who bring back news from the enemy's camp. Hence it is, 
that with none of the whole army are more intimate relations to be maintained than with spies. None should be more liberally rewarded, and no other business should have greater secrecy in order to be preserved. The enemy spies who have come to spy on us must be sought out, tempted with bribes, led away and comfortably housed. Thus they will become converted spies and available for our services. Now, did you know that this book is compulsory reading for the military in this country? Now, with this knowledge in our minds, and we're thinking about the year 1798, the period leading up to it, and the pe period following. Now, does the devil know the Bible, yes or no? Okay. If Wesley could figure out that the first beast of Revelation 13 was the papacy, if Martin Luther could figure that out, if Melanchthon could figure that out, if Cranmer could figure that out, if Ridley could figure that out, then surely the devil had it figured out long before them, right? And if Wesley could figure out that the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 was about to appear because it was the end of the 1,260-day period, then surely the devil knows that too. Because he knows God's plan, and his plan is to subvert. So if he knows this is going to happen, is he going to try to be in the field first? Yes or no? Because he wins who is there first. Now the Bible tells us that the second beast will deceive the whole world by making fire come down from heaven, deceiving all the people. And this fire cannot be literal fire because literal fire is anything but deception. It just kills people. Deception must be something else. So this is a form of religion that will emanate eventually out of this chaos, which will enable the first beast to make the second beast do its bidding. So in other words, it must be able to pull the strings in order to do that. So the first thing you do is, what's the problem with the upcoming nation? Well, it's a Protestant nation. It's a Protestant nation. And the upcoming nation is subject to the King of England and the British Parliament, which had banned the Jesuits and Catholicism out of the realm, under pain of death. So we have to avoid that. We have to avoid a nation adopting a constitution as the British have because that would ban Catholicism and expose it for what it is. So we need something else. We need a constitutional system which will guarantee that the Jesuits can never be thrown out. A constitution which lays no claim on religious convictions. That must include them. So that's the first point. Okay, then what do you do with the Protestants? Well, you divide them up. You infiltrate them. And you create hundreds and eventually thousands and then tens of thousands of denominations. And you pull the strings between all of them. And you make them argue with each other. And you feed them your theology in various forms so that there are so many theologies, you don't know who's who in this zoo. <laughs> and then eventually, you get them all so riled up about the situation which you create in the first place, that they will want to legislate their morality, but the mor morality must be the morality of the first beast. Does this sound logical? Okay. But the Protestants are weary. The Protestants have a problem. The Protestants know that the Jesuits were there to counter the Reformation. And it's written in all the writings of the Reformers. And all the theologians of the Lutheran Church were exposing the Jesuits as the greatest danger to biblical theology. And the Queen of England had told them, if I ever see you in this country, you're dead. You're not allowed to put your foot in this country. You're banned. And the Jesuit plot to blow up the parliament 
had been exposed and the six Jesuits associated with Guy Fawkes were all hung. They were all executed. So how do you get rid of this mindset that the Jesuits are a problem? What's the best thing to do? Disappear. No longer exist. And the same for the Roman Catholic system. If it doesn't exist as a political entity that can command one king to do this and another king to do that at, its, at his bidding, <coughs> well then get rid of it. Get rid of his political power. The Bible says, and one of his heads seemed to have a mortal wound. It doesn't say one of its heads had a mortal wound. It says one of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound. And we know what the date is, 1798, when Napoleon's general marches in and arrests the Pope and takes him away in exile. An aging Pope was already sick, by the way. And the political power of the papacy ends. But that's no use if the Protestants know that the real power behind the throne is the Jesuit general. So you have to get rid of him too. General Ricky, what plans are you going to make to make the enemy think that you're a pushover and no longer exist? Are you just going to disappear? The Society of Jesus could conquer though believe dead, writes the author of Rulers of Evil. It's a wonderful book to read, by the way. And we're going to take some thoughts from that book. And then we're going to color it in with the present day situation, which we need to understand. Because would you agree that the whole world is at the moment deceived? Yes. yes, so we must know who's pulling the strings of deception. Lorenzo Ricci died in his cell at Castel Est Angelo on November 24, 1775. That's what history tells us. What if his death was no more physical than the supposed disestablishment of his army? You see, the Jesuits, in the time of Ricci, were being banned out of Europe, left, right, and center. And the countries which had thrown them out in the first place were the Protestant nations. That is understandable. But then, Portugal banned them. Portugal threw out the Jesuits. Spain banned them. Threw out the Jesuits. France banned them. Threw out the Jesuits. And they shipped them in shiploads to the Vatican without food or anything. And many of them died. Many of the Jesuits died. And this was news. You saw it on CNN that night. <laughs> and what's going on? All these nations. By the way, what are those nations? Portugal, Spain, France. What nations were they? Catholic, Catholic nations. Now, who ruled over all these Catholic nations in the first place? The Jesuits. They were in every form of government. This is a brilliant strategy. And then to make it look real... Well, you kill some of your doomed spies. He speculates further, and he says, During the fall of 1775, Congress authorized a committee made up of Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Lynch, Benjamin Harrison, and George Washington to consider and recommend a design for the first United Colonial Flag. <coughs> the so-called Flag Committee. And they didn't know what flag to choose for the coming Declaration of Independence. And the flag committee, this very prominent flag committee, went and met a particular human being that nobody had ever seen, and he was called the Stranger. He was an elderly European transient known only as the Professor. He had arrived unknown to anyone. Nobody knows how he got there. He was just there. 
But all these prominent men went to have a discussion with the professor. That's history. In July 3, 1776, John Adams took pen in hand and dashed off a letter to his wife, Abigail. Adams was a writer of repute. He took very accurate notes. He never edited. And he wrote very carefully, and he said, yesterday, which must then be July the 2nd, he scribbled, the greatest question was decided, which ever was debated in America, and a greater perhaps never was nor will be decided amongst men. A resolution was passed without one dissenting colony, that these united colonies and of a right ought to have full power to make war, conclude peace, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which other states may rightfully do. So they made a decision to declare independence from Britain and to bring about a war. Okay. And the decision was made on the 2nd of July, 1776. So he said, this day will go down in history. Now, Manly Palmer Hall, who, as you probably know, is a high mason, occultist, famous historian, Masonic historian, writes an interesting piece of history. And he talks about this strange man. It was a grave moment, and not a few of those present feared that their lives would be forfeited for their audacity on the 4th of July. In the midst of the debate where they decided, are we really going to put, go ahead with the decision we made two days ago that we're going to be independent? Are we really going to do it? This will cause war. Maybe England will come with so many troops and wipe us out. Are we really going to do this? And while they were uh, in the valley of decision on the 4th of July to put their stamp on it, they started getting cold feet. The debaters stopped and turned to look upon the stranger who had appeared amongst them. Who was this man who had suddenly appeared in the midst and transfixed them with their, his oratory? They had never seen him before. None knew when he had entered, but his tall form and pale face filled them with awe. This is history. His voice ringing with holy zeal, the stranger stirred them to their very souls. And he gave a tremendous speech, and they all signed the Declaration of Independence. And then he was gone. He had disappeared. Nor was he ever seen again, or his identity established. This is recorded in Hall, Secret Teachings, etc. Who was this man? Where did he come from? Well, let's go back a little bit in history, because you have to be in the field before, then you will gain victory. Maryland history is very interesting because it's bound and grounded to the liturgical calendar of the Roman Catholic Church. We recall how the original settlers of Maryland, many of whom were Roman Catholics, set sail from England under the spiritual direction of Jesuit father Andrew White on November the 22nd, 1633. So the Jesuits had already come, and they'd occupied land, which they called Mary land. It was a huge estate, and it belonged to the Jesuits. It was the feast day of St. Celia, a saint, etc., etc., the voyage had reached landfall the following year, March 25th, on Annunciation Day. This is the feast of the angel Gabriel's announcements to the Virgin Mary. On Annunciation Day, 1634, Father White consecrated the colony of Maryland to the Virgin Mary. That's why it's called Maryland. And it was the second day of July in the year 1776, which happened to be Visitation Day. Interesting. Now, if you go to the encyclopedia, 
then it tells us, commemorating the event recorded in the first chapter of Luke, when the virgin pregnant with the Messiah visits her cousin Elizabeth, who is pregnant with John the Baptist. Nowadays, Visitation Day is celebrated on May the 31st, but in the year 1776, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, it was celebrated on July the 2nd. So they have their liturgy calendar. Now I want you to understand that occultists and Medici learning, Gnosticism, is very strict about their liturgies and their astrological charts and their calendars. God's people should not be involved in such silliness. We have a thus says the Lord and don't have to wait for a certain color of the moon or a shaking or a trembling of whatever sort. I'll give you an example. Peter records that they were on the Mount of Transfiguration and they heard the voice of God announcing, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's a pretty thunderous thing to happen, wouldn't you say? A voice coming from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then he continues, Peter, and he says, but we have a more sure word of prophecy unto which we will do well to take heed. So he says, that which is written, the word of prophecy, is of greater value than even this great miracle of God speaking himself from heaven. What is written down as prophecy is our guideline. So, let's not get too caught up in their funny little dates. It's just for interest's sake. Now, this house over here, I, I guess you all recognize this, don't you? What is it called? Why is it called the White House? Because it's white? Absolutely not. The other day it was rainbow colors. <laughs> it's called the White House because it was the state house of Andrew White, the Jesuit. So to this day it is called the White House. The spiritual director who had prepared the way for this great event. Now, this might seem very strange to the Americans, and I know that some will so shout, oh, you go to the conspiracy theorist again. <laughs> I'm just quoting what this person wrote, and I'm looking at the facts, and then I'm looking at what is happening today, and I put the two together, and one and one happens just to be three which is very conspiratorial because it should actually be two. <laughs> so this is the White House. And we're not going to go into the details of all of these issues. Fact of the matter is, on this great Jesuit estate, which is called Maryland, today the seat of the greatest, most powerful nation's government is situated. And the first flag that they had decided to adopt was actually a flag of one of the Jesuit trading companies. Which means that that flag represented a Jesuit company. That's very fascinating. Now all countries were expelling the Jesuits. And the Jesuits were thrown out of Portugal. They were thrown out all over the place. This is just from reformation.org history. And it says, what happened to these poor Jesuits? All countries had expelled them. They were shipped off to the papal states. Some too old for such treatment died. Others left religion or became secular priests. By 1773, the suppression of the Jesuits was complete. On August 16, the brief of suppression was read to the assembled Jesuits and they dispersed to various locations and other works. And on August 17, Ricky, the unfortunate general, was bundled off to prison in Castel Sant'Angelo. Now, Castel Sant'Angelo 
was a massive church, occupied building, right next to the Vatican. And it happens to have a passage linking it with the Vatican. So that a pope could go there, or a general could go there, while apparently appearing to be in prison. Where he languished the poor soul for two years, not even permitted to celebrate mass or receive visitors. Eventually he died there, this is reformation.org, on November the 24th, 1775, after 15 years as general. That's what history tells us. He testified to the end that the society was innocent, and he sent out one letter after the other, brethren, just pray, pray, you are poor little victims, pray, pray, and pray. That's all he did. And by order of Pope Pius VI, his solemn funeral was held in the church of San Giovanni de Florentini, the church closest to Ricky's prison by order of the same pope. His body was taken to the Gezu, which is the other big Jesuit on Conclave, which I showed you just there, last night, where the, uh, the two founders, or two of the founders of the Jesuit order, are standing on Protestantism and destroying it. Now, it doesn't say who those Protestants is, oh, but I would suggest that they are Luther and maybe Calvin. His body was taken to the Gezu a few hundred meters away and laid to rest in the crypt with the generals who had preceded him. However, Ricky's imprisonment and death and the letter of suppression did not bring the desired end of the society. Because Russia did not ban them. And some of the other kingdoms did not ban them. But for general purposes, they were gone. And the title was also removed. He was always general. Then his title was changed to make it more priestly. So that is what happened. And the Jesuits were gone. Or so it appeared. Jesuit generals were still selected in Russia. And it was kept alive. But then came the unbanning of the Jesuits with papal approval and a statement which said, never again may the Jesuits be banned and the title general was reinstated. By the way, the very Pope who ordered this tremendous funeral is the one who was captured by Napoleon. And please remember that Napoleon was a high initiate Freemason in the first place. So this history is very, very interesting. Now the Jesuits had retrained the minds of the Europeans by something which is called Jesuit theater. And we need to look into this because the war is a battle for the mind. And the Protestants had warned against Jesuit theater. Remember that Martin Luther had said, you may not send your children to be educated where the Bible is not the standard. Remember that? But the Jesuits had become the schoolmasters of Europe, and Jesuit theater was incredibly popular. Encyclopedia Britannica tells us Jesuit drama. Jesuit drama programs of theater developed for educational and propagandist purposes in the colleges of the Society of Jesus during the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. Cultivated as a medium for disseminating Roman Catholic doctrine, drama flourished in the Jesuit schools for more than 200 years, evolving from modest student exercises to elaborate productions that often rivaled the contemporary public stage in polish and technical skill. And then it talks about these great performances where the kings attended and they were swayed. And then afterwards, they were taken to Jesuit retreats where they were subjected to Ignatian spirituality and slowly, slowly, Protestantism was 
torn out of the hands of Protestantism. And in Bavaria, for example, the southern state of Germany, the Jesuits took over completely, eradicated the Protestants entirely. By the mid-17th century, there were nearly 300 Jesuit colleges in Europe, and in almost every one, at least one play given each year. Jesuit playwrights also drew upon material from pagan mythology. I'm just quoting from encyclopedias. Ancient history and contemporary events reinterpreted in terms of Catholic doctrine. Dramas were performed in the national language, and their stagecraft kept pace with all the newest technical developments. Now, if you think back to Rome and that magnificent Colosseum, the stagecraft there was out of this world. They would have floors rising, they would have wild beasts appearing, 